The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYML LP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters. Welcome back to the Personal Safety Show. This is Marcus Melnick from Firearm Mentor and Stress2Logic.com, and I am your host. We are continuing the conversation with Trinetta Sims Riley from Naperville's Blue Moon Estate Sales. How do you recommend dealing with, uh, I'm being facetious when I say this, so it's kind of supposed to be funny, professional estate shoppers, the ones that come in and are super aggressive and don't care, and I don't mean this literally, but shove you out of the way to get their deal. How do you deal with, or how do you recommend shoppers deal with that type of other shopper? Well, I think it first begins with the state sale company hosting the sale and setting the tone for the shoppers that will be in attendance. One of the things we have is um, pretty much, lack of better term, rules and regulations for (laughs) attending the estate sale that sits outside the door before you even walk into the home. We recommend everyone that walk through read. Uh, We do have a greeter that would also reiterate a lot of the things that's on that listing. And if the tone is set right, it's not to say there will not be any shovers, but it will minimize shovers. Uh, But at the same time, we do make it where we manage the traffic. We want to manage how many individuals come into the home. We want to interact with you and ask any questions, see how we can help. And the other thing when it comes to, um, because I've experienced situations where an individual would say there are several items, like grab all the items on that one table, slide them over to somewhere else so that they can walk through all of it. Mm -hmm. Once you experience that the first time, you come up with a strategy of how this will not happen the second time. And okay. so next time the sale was pin these individually so you can't grab them all at once. So now you have to share the space with someone else. I'm not saying we don't want that first person to buy them all, but we do want it to be a, a nice shopping experience for everyone that walked through the door, I, I, I guess is the way I would phrase that so we monitor and but your question was how do you what 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 advice would i give to a shopper as we're experiencing the you know um i would think the bull in the china shop i think they (laughs) (laughs) um honestly i would just say get out their way like (laughs) and that's a good that's a good comment okay sorry i'm like it is so much to see in the state sale I mean, that is why it's such a large home. Just get out their way. <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to have conflict with unnecessary conflict, I guess you'd say. Have you ever no. had to eject anyone from a estate sale? Have we ejected someone? Um, I, I do, and, 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 and believe me, if we truly rejected someone, like... No, eject, not reject, eject for poor behavior. Right, if, we, if we ejected someone from a sale, I totally believe it would be sticking out in my mind okay. right now. So I'm going to have to go with um, we haven't had that <laughs> occur. And may you never have that occur. Yes, occurred. and may we never. Yes, okay. absolutely. So estate sales can be pretty emotional for families, particularly yeah. if the person is deceased and they were close. And I see things that are very nostalgic for me at garage sales. Like my sister had a Fisher Price plastic um, uh, dollhouse that we had as kids. And I'd play G.I. Joe's in it and Star Wars figures. And I, every once in a while I come across it and I'm very tempted to buy it. They have a lot of memories for me and they're not, it's not even my stuff. How do you, have you had training and how do you handle family members who are, completely understandably emotionally affected by uh, this is a really harsh way to say it, by getting rid of mom and dad's stuff or grandma and grandpa's stuff. So I want to comment your question a couple of different ways, if that's okay. Sure. The first one just relates to client selection 
client readiness and really being attentive to that where um, clients will call, they'll indicate they want to have an estate sale as you're talking about the items in the home, as you're walking through looking at what they're, you know, offering as a part of the sale, you are paying attention to their emotions. And really what we would do first is kind of let them know that perhaps they're not really ready to part with these items. And there isn't this hard deadline it depends on them financially, right? If, right? if the home is paid for, if they're still, you know, having expenses to take care of. I mean, but it's totally still in their hands. And we like to really offer them that coaching around timing is up to them. Take your time. Do not rush into this. By no means um, do we want that to be the case. So that's where we start is really client readiness and being able to be very candid with them that you may need a little bit more time and that's okay. Take the time that you need where we just want to make sure that we understand where they're coming from. We're all going to have to go this way one day. And so it comes back to being empathetic, right. And, and just not trying to rush that scenario for them. That's all. Very good. So you mentioned walkthroughs. How long does it take to inventory and price an estate? So that really depends on the size of the home, um, variety of the items for the sale. And what we look at when it comes to, and I know you said inventorying, but what I like to say is our staging of the home. Because one of the things that we do and is really make it where this is an environment that's shoppable. We like to make it a pop-up retail shop experience um, and really make it where it's aesthetically pleasing, it's a safe environment, and people will come and stay for hours and just buy everything up. Um, But it really does come down to size and variety of items in the home because we've had the ability to stage and price a townhome in a week. Um, Okay. And then host that sale, you know, but we've also had very large homes where it was two to three weeks that we were there working, staging, pricing, getting it ready for the sale. Um, But we do have to pay attention to our timeline. So we like to start with that end goal. If there's a closing coming up, if there's um, the family needs to do some work in the home, they have know construction or painters coming in whatever that hard stop is that we're working towards we work backwards from there and and then we just throw our people at it how we need to to make sure we can get that accomplished um so it it really depends but i would typically say anywhere from one to three weeks um three being on the extreme end to get a home ready for an estate sale interesting i i had no idea how long it took, if, uh, but what you said makes makes perfect sense. Can you tell our listeners uh, about your business, your website, where they can contact you in case they have any questions? All right, so Blue Moon Estate Sales, it is a national franchise, and we are estate sale professionals. Uh, we do this for a living. We're local. Uh, we are doing estate sales in our communities, helping families and individuals through what typically can be a challenging and stressful time. And what we do is look to reduce that stress. We take on this service of staging your home, pricing your items, hosting an estate sale. We're taking all of that off of you so that you can plan for that next chapter in your life. Okay, awesome. So what happens to all the unsold stuff? What, ha- what Where does it go? The unsold stuff, once again, it, it depends. But first, what we do is go back to the family, allow them to identify anything at this point that they would prefer to keep. After that, we then work with different organizations that can definitely use these items for their for their causes. And in the very end, when 
very last resort is where then we will call a company that's considered a paid clear out at that right. point to remove items, which typically that's going to be items that may have some form of brokenness, deformity, and, and not true u- future usability. Okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, what final thoughts can you offer on what you do and what people can do if they need your services or they need the services of an estate sale? Take it away. As it relates to final thoughts, first, I would like to share if you're really looking for more information on Blue Moon Estate Sales of Naperville, I want to give you our website that you can go and look at, which is www.bluemoonestate.com sales.com forward slash Naperville dash I L forward slash. And when it comes to blue moon estate sales, um, you can also just Google estate sales near me and we should be one of the companies that come up for you. And as I continue on final thought, when it comes to preparing your home, or even if you believe that an estate sale is something that you are interested in, whether it be you're moving, downsizing, retiring, um, just some big life change that has happened in your home. First things you want to do is really walk through your home with an eye of, I don't want to just say a shopper, but even just as a visitor, but just walk through your own home and take a look at what things you would see as desirable to purchase and may still have some value. And as you walk through your home, also look at things that are personal that you would want to remove before you would actually host an estate sale. And as you're walking through, that's when you get to that point where how much is left? Is it enough left that you're willing to allow someone to take two to three weeks to come through your home and Um, set it up for an estate sale, or are you in a place where you don't have that kind of time to host an estate sale? And it's okay, whichever scenario is you, but those are steps you can take to just start to get your mind prepared for what an estate sale is. And in most cases, it is individuals coming through your current home to purchase the items that you're willing to have a part of the sale. Um, There are other resources that we do like to offer individuals that may not have enough for an estate sale. And those are the types of things we talk through. Because once again, I share, we are service. We are here to help minimize stress. We're here to help individuals move to their next chapter. And that is one of our first and foremost goals is to be that service to help them move to that next chapter. Wonderful. Trinetta, thank you very much for taking the time to educate our listeners on some of the fun finds that you have. And if they have any questions, they can certainly reach you. Again, it's bluemoonestatesales.com forward slash Naperville dash IL forward slash. Trinetta, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. This has been wonderful. I want my listeners to know that this is my dream, teaching people about safety. If it weren't for you, if it weren't for my listeners, I couldn't live my dream. So on behalf of my family and myself, I want to thank each and every one of you for allowing me to live my dream. And I also want to continue to live my dream, and I'm excited to continue to spread the word of safety. Recently, I began a new service as a conference keynote speaker. So if anyone would like for me to speak at future events, or if anyone knows of an introduction or would like to discuss how we can work with one another, I'd love to do just that. The keynote speaking website is www.stress2logic.com. That is S-T-R-E-S-S, the number two, L-O-G-I-C dot com. If you're aware of any conference speaking engagements where you'd like to have me speak, I'd love an introduction. You can always share my electronic business card, which is Marcus Melnick, M-A-R-C-U-S, M-E-L-N-I-C-K dot com. Now back to the show. 
So we're going to transition now to some legal updates that have happened in the court system. This past Monday, there were gun rights groups who asked the United States Supreme Court to overturn the Illinois ban on assault weapons, otherwise known as PICA or the Protect Illinois Communities Act. I don't call it PICA, I call it PU because the whole law stinks. So the petition to the high court was expected after the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in November basically affirmed a lower court ruling that allowed banning AR-15 style rifles and other semi-automatic uh, other semi-automatic rifles in the Illinois legislature to stand. ISRA, or the Illinois State Rifle Association, announced that it would take the case to the Supreme Court on the day that Seventh Circuit ruling was handed down. Richard Pearson, who is the director of the or executive director of the Illinois State Rifle Association, said, quote, our objective from the very beginning of the process that started the moment Governor Pritzker signed the bill into law was to take our case to the United States Supreme Court. And today we followed through on that promise. And now our case is in the hands of the highest court of the land, end quote. Petitions filed by both Illinois State Rifle Association and the National Association for Gun Rights challenged the Illinois law on the Second Amendment basis, claiming that the ban violates the Constitution. In light of the recent Supreme Court hearings that have restricted states and municipalities from regulating firearm ownership, that is, originates from the Bruin case from 2022, which struck down a New York law restricting concealed carry licenses for firearms. Bruin called on na the nation's legislatures to engage in a sober reassessment of their power to impose burdens on the right and keep, to keep and bear arms. The Illinois legislature ignored that call, and instead of tapping on the regulatory brakes, it stomped on the gas and passed a sweeping arms ban that included a ban on the most popular rifle in America. Now, when you hear most popular rifle of America, that's the rhetoric phrase. The really the real phrase is in common use. And because something is the most popular item, it is in common use. In a two to one ruling upholding the lawsuit or upholding the assault weapons ban, Seventh Circuit judges in November ruled kinds of weapons banned under the Illinois law were not protected under the Second Amendment, finding that the right to bear arms could be restricted with weapons that are much more like machine guns and military-grade weapons than they are like many different types of firearms that are used for individual self-defense. I call hooey on this because regular people cannot get machine guns unless they have a lot of money jump through a ton of hoops, and usually that's denied. And as far as military-grade weaponry, there is no military in the world that uses AR-15s or semi-automatic AK-47s. So again, the legislator is, legislature is acting based on emotion. They're acting based on, ooh, that's a scary rifle, yet a different semi-automatic rifle, which can fire the exact same thing, is not banned. So there was not a lot of homework done on the state legislature's part. Even the most important personal freedoms have their limits. Judge Diane Wood wrote for the majority, government may punish a deliberately false fire alarm. It may condition free assembly on the issuance of a permit. It may require voters to prevent, present valid identification cards and it may punish child abuse even if it's done in the name of religion. The right enshrined in the Second Amendment is no different, end quote. Hannah Hill, who's the executive director of the National Association for Gun Rights, their legal arm, said that a string of rulings in federal district and appellate courts have upheld bans similar to Illinois, but said the Seventh Circuit opinion was uniquely egregious. Quote, they basically said that the most popular firearm in America is not a gun for the purposes of the Second Amendment, Hill said, end quote, Hill said. The group's petition, which also names Naperville gun store owner Robert Beavis as a plaintiff, challenges how the appeals court decided that assault rifles, quote, assault rifles, are more dangerous than other weapons. 
What is a defining feature of an especially dangerous or militaristic weapon? The court answers that it is a weapon such as the AR-15, which is capable of inflicting the grisly damage described in some of the briefs. The problem with this is that all firearms are capable of inflicting grisly damage. One might even say that's the firearm's purpose. The state legislature passed this assault weapons ban in response to a mass shooting for the Highland Park 4th of July parade in which the alleged shooter, Robert Cremo III, opened fire on spectators from a rooftop with an M&P Smith & Wesson semi-automatic AR-15, and he pled not guilty to the more than 100 felony counts he faces and is awaiting trial. Yet his father got in trouble and uh, plea bargained for, I believe it was disorderly conduct, served some time, and got out. So if the father is guilty, then I'm going to guess that the son is guilty. Again, not a legal opinion. I am not an attorney. So let's talk about enforcement of the act. The Illinois State Police said they weren't going to enforce the act, and at least 74 Illinois Sheriff's Departments vowed to defy state assault weapons ban. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but any law enforcement officer in the state of Illinois can enforce state statute. And for those of us who live in incorporated areas, the Sheriff's Department, the County Sheriff's Department, does not respond to our emergencies if you're in incorporated areas. For example, I'm in an incorporated town. We have a municipal police department. The municipal police department responds, and there are hundreds of them throughout the state. The trouble is, when you listen to the rhetoric of Illinois Sheriff's Department aren't going to enforce the assault weapons ban, that's great. However, it's not how it works. Local law enforcement is who enforces the laws. And unless all of the local law enforcement agencies say the same thing, people are not safe from prosecution. With that said, there are two or three counties where the state's attorney, I'm going to explain how this works, said they will enforce it. And those three counties are, I believe it is Sangamon County, which is where Springfield is, Lake County, which is up north, and Cook County, which is the biggest county in the world. These state's attorneys are really trying to enforce the law. So if you live in any of these counties, chances are if you get caught with a banned item, you will be prosecuted. Here's what happens. When a police department arrests someone for a misdemeanor, they process the paperwork. Most of the time, the people are let go on what they call an I-bond or recognizance bond. When the charges are felonies, the police department has to contact the local, the county state's attorney, and the county state's attorney approves charges. So if there's enough evidence to approve charges, then they go ahead and do that. If there's not, then they reject the charge and they go back to the police department and perhaps the police department charges the person with a misdemeanor. But in those three counties, You better believe felony charges will be approved for any firearms violations. So currently the state registration portal is still open. I am not an attorney as not an attorney. My expert witness opinion is if you have not registered, do not register. And that's because if you do, The law has said you had until December 31st, 2023. It is now February 2024. If you register your guns now, you take a risk of prosecution because you did not abide by the law that said that you had to register your firearms by December 31st. You're putting yourself in the trick bag. Best thing to do is to store your weapons outside of the state of Illinois until this court case gets shaken out, until the Supreme Court makes their decision. That way, you still own the firearm. You have not lost any money. However, it is legally stored in another state. And even though you own it, you don't have possession of it within Illinois if you have not registered it. If you have registered your firearms, you are good. Your FOID card will be reissued with an endorsement on it. Now, I recently renewed my concealed carry permit, and because the state 
was not printing expiration dates on the actual cards, I didn't think I was going to get a new card because my existing card does not have the expiration date. The expiration date is listed on the state police website, and that's why local stores have to verify ammo purchases and local law enforcement can actually determine the validity of the Floyd card. So I did get a new card. It did not have an endorsement on it. I imagine that's going to be coming in the next few months, but I certainly do have the card. Interestingly enough, I stopped the recording and I logged on to the Illinois State Police Firearm Services Bureau. I just wanted to see if my digital ID card would have an endorsement on it, and it doesn't. It is six weeks into the new year after registration was closed, and the digital cards, which are instantaneously accessible, don't even have the endorsement on it. So what are you doing, state of Illinois? What are you doing, state police? You have all these rules in place, yet there's no follow through on it. And I have to say, shame on you, shame on the legislature. And I firmly believe that if a an elected official passes a law that is clearly unconstitutional, I think they should give up their right to run for office again, or possibly even be removed from office pending the outcome of a court case. A lot of people who are elected are attorneys. They should know better, but their belief system is outweighing their brain system. That's one of the things I talk about in one of my keynotes with overcoming the hot stress mess. It's overcoming that emotional response and having an intellectual reaction to stimulus. Hope you enjoyed the show. Tune in next week for another exciting episode. Thank you. We have monthly concealed carry license CCL classes in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. Dates can be seen at firearmmentor.com slash classes. If you have a question, we can be reached at www.firearmmentorcard.com. That is our electronic business card. has all of our contact information and links in it. It's the easiest way to get a hold of us. Until next time, stay safe out there, and I'll see you at the shooting range. This is Marcus Melnick from Firearm Mentor signing off. The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYMLLP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters.